Um, we're going to go to our second speaker, um, who is Paul Fidel. Um, Paul uh, has been at Louisiana State University since 1995. Um, he is currently a um, professor and holds an endowed chair in oral and cranial facial biology. Um, he's also the director of the Center for Excellence in Oral and Cranial Facial Biology and associate dean for research at the LSU School of Dentistry. Um, and Paul is going to speak to us um, about host defense and immunomodulation of mucosal candidiasis. Thank you, David, for the nice introduction. I want to thank the four members as well for the invite. Uh, it's a great honor to be able to contribute to this. Um, I am going to stay in the vagina and also include the oral cavity and stay out of the gut for now and um, speak about uh, some immunology and, and really um, focus in more on the, on the, the yeast. Uh, first, tell you about the organism that, that I study, the Canada albicans. This is a dimorphic fungal organism. Um, it occurs uh, in the blastic canidia form at lower temperatures and lower pHs, and then will switch to a hyphal mycelial form at higher temperatures and higher pHs. And you can see that the mycelium will emanate and grow right from the, the budding yeast side. This is a commensal organism of mucosal tissues, um, considered to be normal flora. And as a result, we've all developed Canada specific adaptive immunity to protect us. Um, and it normally will exist in the blastic canidia form um, in its quiescent state. But the, this organism is very strange in the fact that it can also become an opportunistic pathogen of those same mucosal tissues and is largely seen as hyphal forms in, in the, under that setting. Um, and as a result, most of the, inf the infections. Um, are either oral pharyngeal candidiasis, which we call OPC, or commonly known as oral thrush, dentrostomatitis, or DS, and vulvovaginal candidiasis, and then a, uh, another form of that, which is recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis, or RVBC. And it all depends on how the organism itself either changes for virulence or the, the host, and, and a lot of it has to do with the environmental factors associated with the host. The organism, uh, when it inv invades, it's very superficial. You can see the hyperforms here, invading very superficial layers of the epithelium. You take a smear, you can find the hyperforms associated with the epithelial cells, and also, at times and oftentimes, a lot of leukocytes. This organism also forms a biofilm on those same mucosal tissues. You can see here from a scanning electron micrograph, uh, the yeast as well as the hyperforms. And then we use confocal microscopy as a means to confirm the extracellular matrix. We have a stain that, for, uh, that uh, stains for polysaccharide. So the red haziness that you see associated with the organism is considered to be evidence of extra, extracellular matrix um, as, as definite, defined as a biopsy. If you see, uh, you can actually see, and uh, the biofilm associated is the, the oral candidiasis, um, the lesions associated with the buccal mucosa, the, uh, the palate, the tongue. Um, these particular um, uh, infections uh, will be, in, in this case, uh, the symptoms are, are just painful, hard, difficult swallowing. You end up with wasting and so forth. Uh, the symptoms for the other infections are a little different. Dentrostomatitis can be irritating, also some pain, whereas vaginal candidiasis is the itching and the burning and erythema. So, Actually, the, the symptomatology is quite different for each of these infections. Now, in terms of the epidemiology of mucosal candidiasis, it's quite different in, in all these forms. And I don't know if my terms are going to be good after hearing Larry, but um, oral pharyngeal candidiasis is a disease of immunocompromised individuals. These will be individuals largely HIV-infected population, very susceptible to transplant patients, patients on chemotherapy. Um, as opposed to vulvovaginal candidiasis, which is a disease of what we would consider to be immunocompetent, otherwise healthy women, if you take healthy in the right state. Um, and then dentrostomatitis is, is a similar, it's a, it's a disease of immunocompetent, otherwise healthy denture wearers for the sure. most part, um, largely in the older population of, that have the dentures and, and sometimes immune reactivities and so forth that we do. So you can, you can just see from the epidemiology that the host defenses um, that are responsible for protection against any one of these infections are very different for each particular site. And that's really what I want to impress upon you today and talk about. 
Now, for the non-immunologists in the room, I just wanted to, to get some terms out that I'll be speaking of. Uh, when we speak about host defense, we're largely talking about cells. These would be the leukocytes. Um, we speak of T cells, CD4 cells, or CD8 cells, um, or B cells. That's part of the adaptive response. We also speak of neutrophils, macrophages, which are part of the innate immune response. And I'll be speaking of epithelial cells as well, mainly the mucosal types that are associated as well with the, the innate response. Then we speak of cytokines. These are soluble um, biological response modifiers. We call them interleukins, chemotractins, chemokines, and such. And then the receptors actually bridge the gap uh, between the cells and the cytokines for the actual biological responses. You can see how these receptors and cells interact with one another, and then cytokines and, and the biological response modifiers are produced. And this is how our immune, our immune system works and how, how we get responses. Terms for today's talk that I wanted you to press upon you is when I speak about cells, I'll be talking about CD4 T cells, but also um, actually more so about CD8 T cells. Neutrophils, or which we call polymorphonuclear neutrophils, PMNs, and then the epithelial cells. Of the receptors, I will be speaking of E cadherin. Uh, I'll be speaking of an XNA1. These are, these are sort of atypical type of, of receptors, so I wanted to bring them out. And then of the cytokines, of the bi biological response modifiers, again, a, a sort of atypical, uh, non-traditional type of cytokine, which is called the alarmants. So what I'd like to impress upon you or convince you of is, is that host defense against Canada albicans at the different mucosal sites is extremely different. The immune factors associated with protection and susceptibility to infection are unique to the anatomical site. And also then the role of the mucosal biofilm and pathogenesis is likewise different at each, at each mucosal site. So in terms of the dogma that we've used in terms of host defense against uh, mucosal candidiasis, it's always been thought, and for a long, long time, that, host that for protective host defenses against mucosal candidiasis requires CD4 T cells. And this was the protective response. You obtained resistance to infection as a result of that. For the most part, host defense against oral candidiasis follows that dogma. There are some caveats, and the caveats are that in HIV disease, those individuals lose their CD4 cells, and they do get increased susceptibility to opportunistic infections, largely uh, oral candidiasis. But the oral candidiasis in these individuals can either be recurrent, sporadic, and some of them don't get infections at all. So obviously the question is, do other immune responses function in some capacity for protection? And it turns out that we've identified CD8 cells as a, as a secondary player when, uh, it, and, and plays a role in protection when the CD4 cells are, in fact, lost. In terms of host response against vaginal candidiasis, you could throw that all out. It goes against dogma completely. Uh, we see no role for adaptive immunity. And we actually see a strong role for epithelial cells, um, predominantly in resistance. And then it, we see the role for neutrophils and other innate uh, cell type uh, associated with susceptibility. Dentrostomatitis, we're not really sure yet. This is, some, this is an area we're, we're getting into now and trying to understand uh, what type of host responses occur. So I'm going to talk first about oral candidiasis, then follow with vaginal, and then um, talk about the biofilms. So when we've looked at oral, uh, patients with oral candidiasis, and look specifically at those individuals with less than 200 CD4 cells. These will be the ones that are considered susceptible to the opportunistic infections with reduced blood CD4 cells. Looked at a number of cell types, but one in particular was the CD8 cells in these lesions. And in fact, we found that in a healthy site, there was a smattering. These red dots here are the, are the presence of the CD8 cells, a smattering. But in, a, in an infected site, in a, in a disease site, there was a large accumulation of these CD8 cells that were lined up along the epithelial uh, lamina propria interface, and they seemed to have been called in in response to a problem. Um, but, the, but the issue was that these cells were all locked in this, lamina, uh, this uh, interface area, and the organisms, as I showed you before, is out here at the edge of the epithelium, and we were very curious as to why they weren't, weren't moving through there. We took a look at these particular cells, and they were all actually very normal activated memory T cells. So they should have been able to function adequately, and if they were pr to provide protection, they should have been able to migrate through that tissue. Well, the problem with migrating through tissue is you have to have the right homing receptors and the right adhesion molecules for this to happen. And normally when a cell moves into tissues uh, and goes through the vasculature, they, they have certain receptors on them. And in fact, 
they, the tissues themselves will upregulate certain uh, receptors called adhesion molecules that will sort of trap the cells as they come through. And in fact, these homing receptors then, they're associated with it, will, will hook up and finally stop the cell from, from rolling, and then it was able to ex extravasate through into the tissues. So this is the process by which those cells I just showed you probably got into the tissues. So what we did then was looked at a series of adhesion molecules and homing receptors on the surface of these cells, and one particular one um, with uh, a, an adhesion molecule called MADCAM, which was associated with migration of cells into mucosa, we saw that in a disease site there was a, a significant in, um, enhanced uh, expression of, of that adhesion molecule and shown to be statistically significant. So that seemed to be uh, a means by which it made sense that the cells got into the tissue. However, another homing receptor and adhesion molecule called e cadherin allows cells to migrate through mucosa. And in this particular case, we saw a significant downregulation or degradation of, of the uh, epithelium of the uh, e cadherin on the infected tissue and, and shown here to be a statistically significant number of patients. So this seemed to be potential dysfunction that, we, that we're seeing associated with, um, with it uh, altogether. And then this begged the, the question as to whether or not um, this changed over time. So the question was, what, does the degradation or, or the reduction in the ECAT heron, is it transient or, um, or not? Is it, is it, uh, can it be reversed? And do cells themselves, under a good uh, or normal, what we call normal ECAT heron expression, do, can C8 cells sort of migrate through this tissue? And in fact, the uh, study that we conducted did show that after treatment of patients with oral candidiasis, that e cadherin was able to be reversed and go back more towards normal levels. And in fact, when we found patients that had increased fungal burdens but not disease associated, that there were some more T cells, uh, the CDA cells traveling and, and migrating through the mucosa. So it, it begged the, uh, the, the question, um, uh, or at least answer some of the questions relative to, to um, some of this uh, processes. So our, our sort of overall hypothesis to this whole process is that if you have a particular patient with less than 200 CD4 cells that is protected, you have normal levels of e cadherin, and when those cells are able to migrate in, they're able to migrate through the mucosa, and they, these individuals are held in check and their, their yeast levels are, are stay about the same. If, in, if, on the other hand, the e cadherin becomes degraded or, or changed in some manner, then that uh, will prohibit the cells that are coming in from, from actually uh, migrating up to the edge of the epithelium and, in fact, um, uh, not be able to provide any protection, and then the organism is able to flourish and form the biofilm and so forth. And it turns out that candida itself can degrade e cadherin. So it's a, it's a sort of immune evasion mechanism, a chicken and an egg thing, but if, if in fact, uh, that, that candida gets to a point where it degrades e cadherin, it will save itself and, and able to flourish. Uh, we feel, though, that there are uh, treatments and, and therapies that could, now that we know that the e cadherin can be reversed and uh, is transiently reduced, that we could probably enhance that uh, e cadherin and get that uh, levels up so that the cells will actually uh, migrate through. All right, so move on to vaginal candidiasis, and again, tell you that things are very, very different. Um, as opposed to oral candidiasis, we find no protective role for any T cells uh, or adaptive immunity in general, but we do find a lot of immunoregulation. And as, we, as Larry mentioned earlier, this is a reproductive site. You really do not want to have a high level of in inflammation or an adaptive immune response every time you're exposed to this particular organism that you've developed immunity to. So there have been mechanisms that have evolved, we think, that sort of stops that whole adaptive immune response from working. And there's a variety of cytokines and cells that we found present in the vaginal mucosa that, that, is a, that uh, speaks to this. On the other hand, so what, what does protection, what, how, can, how can a woman be protected if you don't have the adaptive immunity? Well, it turns out that um, the epithelial cells themselves have the ability to inhibit the growth of Canada. This is a very non-inflammatory process but it actually enables asymptomatic colonization to remain and keep the organism in check. Now, I'll show you a little bit about this. Several years ago, we, we showed that oral and, uh, and as well as vaginal epithelial cells have the ability to inhibit the growth of yeast at relatively low uh, effector target ratios. 
And in fact, um, individuals with oral candidiasis had reduced levels of this activity when, when under an infectious condition as opposed to those without infection or uh, without OPC or, or HIV negative. And in fact, women with vaginal candidiasis that were symptomatic had lower levels of this activity as compared to those that were asymptomatically colonized or not colonized. So it had some clinical relevance that this epithelial cell activity would be important. We found that this required cell contact, but there was no metabolic activity occurring within the epithelial cell to, to, to enable this, this inhibition. Um, and it, in fact, requires intact but not necessarily live epithelial cells because we could get the activity if we fixed the cells as long as they were intact. Um, activity is, is static, it's not subtle. It doesn't kill the yeast, it just stops it from, from growth. And the actual receptor is acid labile. Um, in, uh, in fact, the, the uh, acid treatment doesn't degrade the, or doesn't affect the viability of cells, but, but it either degrades or uh, affects the, this particular receptor. So this, this provided a great tool to be able to identify what this receptor was. And it turns out that this receptor is an XNA1. It's a 33 KD acid label protein. And in fact, def defined as a molecule that affects signaling cascades within cells that inhibit growth, among a lot of other functions. But this made a lot of sense for a particular uh, receptor associated with this. And in fact, it looks as though this is, creates a nice symbiosis. If you have the Nexin A1 associated with the epithelial cells affecting Canada, it's a great symbiotic relationship because the, the host benefits by the fact there's no inflammation going on, inv no invasion of the tissue, it maintains commensalism via this uh, receptor activity on the yeast, and, it, and we think that it signals the yeast to shut down its growth. So the metabolic activity is not within the epithelial cell, but within the candida itself. And then the benefit from Canada, oops, benefit from Canada is that it sacrifices its growth um, for protection against other immune responses that might otherwise kill it. So it's a form of immune evasion. There's no danger signals associated with this. And in fact, then we feel that an XNA1 may, uh, can be exploited to increase activity in those that are, that are more susceptible. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to now what's associated with susceptibility to vaginal candidiasis. And in fact, symptomatic infection of vaginal candidiasis is associated with an acute inflammatory response, but not of the adaptive immune system, but of the innate immune system. And it involves neutrophils, or these polymorphonuclear neutrophils, um, these are, they don't, they're non-clearing. They don't seem to function well in that microenvironment, but they actually create a lot of the symptoms that are associated with, with vaginal yeast infection, uh, more so than the organism itself. And so it, 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 uh, it has sort of changed our thought processes on this whole issue. So the whole idea of protection and susceptibility to infection has gone through a paradigm shift over the past several years now, going away from some deficiency in adaptive immunity to actually issues of innate immunity. These particular studies were done through cross-sectional clinical studies as well as animal models, and they taught us a lot, but they couldn't tell us what the factors associated with susceptibility were until we actually entered into a live challenge human model where we were able to follow the natural history of women given a vaginal yeast inoculum. And then that was followed up with animal models, and we were really able to sort of unravel what was going on here. And what we saw was that under symptomatic condition um, in, a, in any woman that was inoculated, we would see the cellular infiltrate associated with the symptomatic episodes that were uh, the tri-nucleated polymorphonuclear neutrophils. Under an asymptomatic condition, a woman that just became colonized, had no symptoms, or was not colonized at all, there was really no level of this infiltrate at all. And it turns out that in women with no history of vaginitis, 90% of them were asymptomatic following this inoculation, as opposed to women with an infrequent episodes of vaginal candidiasis. These are women that would take oral contraceptives and be susceptible, on antibiotics, be susceptible, hormone replacement therapy. That about 55% of those women become symptomatic. And if you put those women specifically in their susceptible state, the susceptibility raised to about 90% symptomatic. So it's very interesting of, of how, this, how this unfolded for us. And so we've been studying this whole process of asymptomatic and symptomatic condition, and we were able to actually simulate this in mice 
uh, where we could inoculate the mice, and a certain percentage of them had the high levels of, of, of PMNs, and a certain other percentage had low levels of PMNs. So we, we were able to simulate this condition. And looking at the, the uh, PMNs themselves, they, they, they were, um, were non-clearing. They were not protective. Uh, they didn't do anything to the yeast burden, but in the clinical side, we think that they were the whole inflammatory process was, was from those cells created the symptoms associated with vaginitis. In the mice, the PMNs were also non-clearing. They, they didn't work at, at any rate in that vaginal environment, but the difference between getting PMNs and not had something to do with differential early adherence if it did. adhered very quickly, it seemed to send a signal that it was dangerous. If it didn't adhere as quickly, it didn't. So yet we were able to get about a 50-50 rate or 60-40 rate. So in essence, it's the Canada associated with the epithelial cells that creates a signal that then leads to this pathology associated with these with these neutrophils. In fact, the chemo we looked try to find this chemotactic signal. We figured this was this was the, the, the holy grail for us, and we looked at every cytokine and chemokine known to man that would be traditional and typical. We looked at symptomatic versus asymptomatic, and we just could not find it. Um, all types, pro-inflammatory, otherwise, wasn't there. We did a proteomic approach by looking at lavage fluids, vaginal lavage fluids, and look at the, the, the differences in the proteins. And we found a particular protein that was unique in those that were symptomatic, and we, we identified this as a S100A8 and A9 protein called alarmant. And these are low molecular weight calcium binding proteins. They're expressed in neutrophils and epithelial cells, among other cells. And they are associated with inflammatory responses that correlates to PMN infiltration. So this is really considered a biomarker for inflammation. And in fact, um, we confirmed this by ELISA and Western blot uh, protein and messenger RNA. We, we were able to show that they were in de indeed produced by vaginal epithelial cells in response to Canada. And we used an antibody uh, antibodies to show that they uh, inhibited the PMI migration by the vaginal uh, lavage fluid in the in vitro chemotaxis assay. Um, so what we think here is that Canada associates itself with the, um, with the epithelial cells, and then that sends a signal if, if brought on in the right manner that this uh, uh, calcium binding pro or the uh, alarmins are being produced, that pulls the first line of PMNs in, and then the PMNs are able to produce this as well which amplifies the whole effect, and you have a significant pro-inflammatory event. So we've been since able to show that we can actually in, induce the PMN migration by uh, alarmins produced in a eukaryotic expression system, whereby in vitro, in terms of chemotaxis, the S100A8 was able to induce chemotaxis, and given to in the vagina of animals, we're able to induce the PMN migration. The A9 was not able to, and that made uh, some, and that was true of the uh, antibody studies as well. So we really feel that um, uh, there's a there's a means by which uh, alarmins might be associated uh, with this process. And this is this is sort of how we see this happening. Women with recurrent vaginitis are highly susceptible to the infection. And their, their epithelial cells are very highly sensitive to the yeast. So a little bit of yeast is okay, but you just get a little bit more somehow, and that signals that epithelial cell to, in fact, produce the alarmins, which then now enables these PMNs to come in. And that whole process um, will, in fact, uh, increase the symptoms. And through that, we think the pH raises a little bit. And as I said, if the pH raises a little bit, that's a great environment for hypo growth. So now the yeast itself are able to flourish and grow a little bit more. As I said, the epithelial cell activity against the yeast may not be as strong in these women, so you end up with a full-blown infection. Women with infrequent history that take antibiotics or oral contraceptives, you have the same, same basic process, except their epithelial cells are, more sen are less sensitive. So they can handle more yeast, but you, they take antibiotics or oral contraceptives, and you tip the scale, and the whole process will occur um, in, the, in the same manner to get the symptomatic infection. However, oh, a woman with no history of vaginitis that's resistant, their epithelial cells are not sensitive to yeast at all and actually highly tolerant, so they can handle a lot of yeast. They take epithelial, I mean, take oral, oral estrogen, the antibiotic therapy, hormone replacement therapy, it's fine. They're, they're just, they don't signal that, that cell at all. The epithelial cell activity against that yeast is also pretty good, so it keeps it controlled. In essence, you have no symptoms, 
And in fact, the yeast stay in the, the blastic canidia phase and, and you have basically asymptomatic colonization. So this, I think, is important for diagnostics and treatment. The current diagno diagnostics for VVC are actually limited. The challenge is being the candidate commensal. So it's present in the asymptomatic state. Positive diagnosis requires symptoms and culture positive, but the current diagnostic tests are based on organism alone. So can we develop a better diagnostic by, by looking for candidate and the symptoms using alarmins as the marker for the inflammatory event and, um, and use that uh, accordingly? And also immunotherapeutically, block or neutralize those alarmins, potentially we could reduce or eliminate the um, symptoms and relegate Canada back to the commensal state. The last thing I just want to touch on very briefly is the idea of mucosal biofilms in, in pathogenesis. Um, Canada does form biofilms on the oral vaginal mucosa. The kinetics and architecture are very similar. But we do have the ability to use mutants that will not, in fact, uh, form biofilms but colonize the tissue normally. So here, again, you have the, the uh, uh, confocal and the SEM of, of a wild type, and here you see the mutants that, that are, uh, you don't see the haziness and so forth. There's no extracellular matrix. So we looked at this in the, in the vaginal tissue and tried to determine uh, what effect the mucosal biofilm had on this particular uh, situation. And in fact, there was no, no difference. Um, the, the biofilm deficient mutants had the same levels of PMNs, virtually the same levels of CFUs, and the same levels of the alarm in production. So there was just seemed to be not, not a role for the biofilm in particular in this case. On the other side, in the dentrostomatitis, we see a completely different story. And we've just uh, uh, been able to um, sort of produce a model of dentrostomatitis. This is, this is kind of cool, so I like to always show it. It, it has a, this is the, the maxilla and the mandible of a rat. You see that it opened. Um, we have a, a denture that we make uh, from, a, from unique with an impression that has a fixed portion to it and then a removable portion stuck by a magnet here so that you can take it on and off and look for biofilm and inoculate and look at the whole issue of biofilm and, and, and get the, the, the disease situation. And in fact, over time, we see that the, the biofilm does develop on both the denture and the palate over an eight-week period. You can see how the red haziness comes across a little stronger as time goes on. And in fact, those animals um, do acquire uh, disease states, um, a, pin, a score of one or a, a two of, of uh, hyperplasia here you can see in a, in a lot of those animals. However, when you inoculate with the biofilm deficient mutants, only the wild type animals acquire disease. The biofilm deficient mutants uh, have no disease. So there seems to be a direct relationship with biofilm, in fact, in this. And so the process by which this happens is we think the denture um, acquires Canada first, forms a biofilm, and then that biofilm starts seeding the actual tissue, and then the tissue itself will induce uh, somewhat of an immune response, but this continuous feeding and biofilm formation then on the actual mucosa itself will spawn even an amplified uh, immune uh, reaction, and in fact, uh, probably is a chronic inflammatory response induced by the host rather than the organism itself again. So we're currently looking at what these might be and how they function, and in fact, um, what type of immune response this might be. So in general, dentrostomatitis, you have biofilm required for disease. It makes a lot of sense because the disease is initiated after biofilm formation and it's chronic rather than acute. Vaginitis, on the other hand, biofilm is not required for infl inflammation of the symptoms. This disease is acute and initiated by the, by the adherence and sensitivity to the epithelial cells. So the biofilm in this situation is probably more critical to treatment and clearance of drugs or the immune response. You can uh, uh, think about the fact that maybe the PMNs can't penetrate the, the biofilm well enough to have a function, or antibodies might not be able to penetrate well enough, and so forth. So uh, we think that the role is very different. So overall, I hope I was able to impress upon you that host defense against Canada is extremely different at the different mucosal sites whether it be adaptive immunity with T cells at the oral or innate immunity, uh, PMNs, neutrophils, epi cells uh, in the vagina, and that the immune factors associated with protection and susceptibility are unique to the site. We have the alarmins in the vagina, the annexin in both, both tissues associated with protection, the cadherin in the oral cavity associated with protection, and then finally the role of mucosal biofilm pathogenesis likewise very, very different 
for each particular site. So uh, I just want to thank uh, so many collaborators that have a role in all this. Uh, people in my lab, it's a lot of years worth of work that I tried to, to show you today. Um, our grant supporter couldn't do this without the clinical staff. Um, and I would say that uh, the Denture Stomatitis Project, my uh, colleague and wife is actually here. She's the PI of the Denture Stomatitis Project. And um, that's really unraveling very nice. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, any pressing questions or requests for clarification? Well, I think we'll have time for discussion. Um, one thing I would like to return to um, later is is your your thoughts and, and what you think the, the critical issues are with respect to the interaction of Canada and the indigenous microbiota Absolutely. and for all these issues. 